Hello, my name is Victoria Farrow, and in this presentation, I'd like to explore turning fall vegetables into delicious dishes. At the conclusion of the presentation, you'll find full recipes for all of the dishes that we discuss. Our focus will be on recipes that are nutritious, easy and versatile, include challenging vegetables, and involve techniques that are useful for all kinds of cooking. In this presentation, we're going to cook with vegetables from a number of families. We'll cook with winter squash and pumpkins from the cucurbit family. From the nightshade family, we'll work with eggplant. From the morning glory family, we'll work with the sweet potato. People often ask me whether they should be using yams or sweet potatoes. In reality, almost every potato we find at the grocery, even when it's called a yam, is actually a variety of sweet potato. There's a tendency to label the newer, darker-skinned sweet potatoes with orange flesh as yams to distinguish them from older-style sweet potatoes. At bottom left is a photo of a true yam, which has a bark-like covering. It's quite starchy and much less sweet than a sweet potato. We will also feature a leek recipe and use other vegetables from the allium family in many recipes. And we'll use okra from the mallow family for a great fall recipe. We'll focus on a number of vegetables from the brassica family. Broccoli, kale, turnips, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and rutabagas. Nutrition is the main reason for this focus, though I would add that they're also delicious. Brassicas are cruciferous vegetables, which are nutritionally dense, meaning that per calorie they provide exceptional nutrition. Six members of this family have actually been bred from the same plant, the wild mustard plant. They have been developed from the leaf and flower buds, the stem, and the leaves, which explains the similarities in flavor. These vegetables can be challenging for some people because their phytonutrients and calcium can give them a somewhat bitter taste. People's tolerance for, and sometimes even their preference for bitterness, varies widely. My feeling is that when balanced with other tastes, bitter can add enjoyable complexity. Truffles come to mind. The sweet candy is often rolled in unsweetened cocoa. The slightly bitter cocoa heightens the candy's wonderful sweetness. We're going to work with balancing these vegetables' bitterness, often by roasting, which brings out their sweetness, and by adding oil and salt. The result can be absolutely delicious. A great source of nutritional information can be found in this book, eating on the wild side. If you're interested in not only selecting the best vegetables, but also storing and cooking them for maximum nutrition, this is an excellent guide. Much of the nutrition information I provide in this presentation is from this book. As you're working with fall vegetables, be sure to always work safely. Some vegetables, like winter squash, can be very hard to cut. I will provide some tips, but a general principle to always guide you is that you want to first make the vegetable you're cutting stable on a cutting board. Often that means taking a slice off one end or a side to create a flat surface. It also may mean working gradually to insert a knife or working with one side at a time. Two other important concerns are sanitizing surfaces, even when you're working just with vegetables, and always bringing food to the appropriate temperature, even when warming leftovers. The first recipe we'll work with is for two brassicas vegetables, cauliflower and broccoli. And the wonderful thing is that in this recipe, both are used raw, which significantly increases their antioxidants. The first recipe we'll work with is for two brassicas vegetables cauliflower and broccoli. And the wonderful thing is that this recipe uses both raw, which significantly increases their antioxidants. 
To prepare the cauliflower, I make it stable by cutting across the stem to make it flat. I stand the head up and slice it in half. I then cut it into quarters and slice out the core. For this recipe, we cut the cauliflower and broccoli by teasing out very small trees using a paring knife. This makes a beautiful salad. But I've also found that it works just fine to slice both thinly and then cut the slices into smaller pieces. Often you'll need to cut the pieces in half again or even into thirds. You want to keep the pieces fairly small. Combine the broccoli and cauliflower with the raisins and sunflower seeds. Make the dressing. I use light mayonnaise whenever possible as it has less than half the fat and calories of regular mayonnaise. Then we'll add some apple cider vinegar and red wine vinegar. Add sugar to taste, whisk, and then mix in with the other ingredients. The result is a refreshing and nutritious side that keeps very well. If I'm cooking cauliflower, I tend to steam or roast it rather than boiling to retain as many of the nutrients as possible. We're going to look at some recipes that cook the cauliflower in one of these ways to retain nutrients. Our next recipe is a twist on roasted cauliflower. It's called zippy roasted cauliflower. For this recipe, cut or break your cauliflower into golf ball size florets. Next, mix the coating, which includes Parmesan cheese, canola oil, soy sauce, coarse ground Dijon mustard, grated lemon zest, lemon juice, garlic powder, onion powder, coarsely ground black pepper, and ground cayenne pepper. There was a time when I prided myself on never using garlic or onion powder. I always used fresh, and fresh is often best, but there are cases when powdered works better, and this is one of them. The powder distributes the onion and garlic flavor throughout the coating. Next, we toss the cauliflower with the coating and roast at 450 degrees. The original recipe said that you would find yourself standing at the stove eating all the little bits left on the baking sheet. They were right. This is a delicious dish that can be an appetizer or added as a side at a meal. It's great served either warm or at room temperature. Our next recipe cooks cauliflower in a very different way, keeping it again nutritious by sauteing it rather than boiling it. It's Mediterranean cauliflower rice. Recently, cauliflower and other vegetable rices have become quite popular. You can find vegetables already riced in the grocery store. But it's actually very easy to make cauliflower rice yourself if you have a food processor. I cut the cauliflower as before and remove the core, break it into florets, and process it in batches. Be sure not to over-process. You don't want puree. I pulse it. For my processor, it takes only about five pulses. Zest and juice the lemon. When you buy lemons, be sure they're not rock hard. You want a softer lemon that will provide lots of juice. I use a microplane to zest the lemon. If you're using toasted almonds, which I highly recommend you do, they add great texture, toast them in a dry skillet, stirring often. This is not a time to get involved doing something else. They'll burn very quickly. Next, chop your red onion and parsley. You can use another type of onion, but the red onion adds color and is also a fairly sweet onion. That said, any time I'm making a dish featuring uncooked onion, I always sample a piece of the onion ahead of time to be sure it's not too strong. If it is, you can cut the onion up and let it sit in a bowl of ice water until the sharpness is tamed enough for your taste. It's best to hand chop the onion rather than using a food processor. A processor chops the red onion up so finely that you'll end up with pink rice. Mince or finely chop the garlic and put it and the oil in a cold pan and saute over medium heat until fragrant. 
Often recipes will call for heating the oil and then adding the garlic, but that often results in burned garlic, which can be very bitter. It's best if the garlic warms with the oil in the pan. When it's fragrant, add the onions and saute until they are softened and translucent. Add the cauliflower, red pepper flakes, and salt and pepper and stir to combine. Saute until the cauliflower is hot and turning golden. Remove from the heat and stir in the lemon juice, lemon zest, parsley, and almonds. This is great warm or at room temperature and easily replaces rice or potatoes in a meal. It's a nutritious way to reduce carbohydrates and calories. Here we're eating it with other leftovers as a luncheon vegetable plate. Our next cauliflower recipe is a great entree, cauliflower and cheese pie, which has become a family favorite for us. The cauliflower in the pie is roasted, which brings out the vegetable's natural sweetness. You can cut it into quarters as before, core it, and break it or cut it into florets. You'll need to toss the cauliflower in about one tablespoon of olive oil before roasting. I drizzle the oil on the cauliflower while it's on the baking sheet and toss it to coat so none of the oil is wasted. When it's done and cool enough to handle, rough cut it into chunks. Like all quiches, this pie can be made with no crust. This recipe, though, uses a potato crust. You shred the potatoes and squeeze them to remove excess liquid as you want the crust crisp. You can do that by enclosing it in paper towels and squeezing, but as you can see in the center picture, even stronger paper towels don't hold up all that well. I prefer to use a clean cotton kitchen towel. Press the shredded potatoes into a greased or oiled pie plate. I like to use a cooking spray for my pie plate. A half cup measuring cup works well to press the potatoes against the side of your pie plate. When the sides and bottom are covered, brush with one tablespoon melted butter and then bake. I like mine very crispy, so this was my most recent crust. You can cook to your desired doneness. Prepare the remaining ingredients. I always include the shredded kale, which I finely chop. You'll also need to chop the onions and shred the cheese. I like to use a combination of Swiss and sharp cheddar. When measuring shredded cheese, I always gently pack it into the measuring cup. Saute the onions and kale in olive oil. Beat the eggs and milk. Combine everything and pour it into the baked potato shell and bake. Cool slightly and slice. You'll be surprised how delicious this pie is. I've also made the pie with sweet potato crust, following the same directions. I've also made it with cauliflower cut and roasted in planks as shown here. The core that we discarded when making florets will actually cook and is quite edible. It will just take a little bit longer to roast. You just chop up the whole plank, core and all. Here's a pie made with cauliflower roasted that way and a sweet potato crust. We've been trying to avoid cooking these nutritious vegetables in water, but there is a way to retain the nutrients even when you're doing that by using the cooking liquid in the sauce. Southern Italian pasta with broccoli is a delicious way to use that technique. For this dish, we want to use the stems as well as the florets. In truth, I always use the stems. If I don't cook them, I peel them and slice them thinly for eating raw. They're delicious. We peel them for this recipe too. It's usually easiest and safest to just use a vegetable peeler running it down the stalk away from you. Chop the stems and the florets. You may have to remove a few odd bits of fibrous peel like those in the, shown by the blue arrow. Heat your pan with oil and garlic over medium heat and then add the red pepper flakes and stir. 
We heat the garlic and red pepper flakes first for a minute or two so the oil can extract the flavors and carry them throughout the dish. Oil extracts much stronger flavors than liquid does. Then add the broccoli and saute briefly. Add water and salt, cover the pan, and turn the heat down a bit and cook until the broccoli is soft. Great Parmesan cheese for serving. I'm not very fussy about some ingredients, but I feel that freshly grated Parmesan really is worth the extra cost and trouble. A lot of what is sold as Parmesan is really pretty lacking in flavor. Imported Parmesan should have the rind on, and it should be imprinted as you see here. If you can, it's a great product to use. Every now and then when I make a sauce, I find it isn't thick enough to suit me. Remember that any time you're cooking a vegetable or anything else in a liquid, and you need to thicken the liquid but you don't want to overcook the solids, you can use a slotted spoon or strainer to remove the solids. Then you can put the liquid on the stove in a wide pan and heat it to evaporate the correct amount of liquid off. Chefs call this reduction. When your sauce is about ready, cook your pasta. In recent years, I've started always measuring my pasta. It's so easy to make more than you need. I determine what amount my serving should be and measure accordingly. If I put my bowl on the scale first and then turn on my scale on, it will discount the weight of the bowl and start at zero. This is referred to as establishing tear weight. It's very handy to have a scale that will calculate this way. Mash or process the sauce. I like to just mash it. It will really become a sauce. Drain your pasta. I never rinse pasta if I'm adding sauce. The starchy film on the pasta helps the sauce cling to the pasta. The key is to have the sauce ready to immediately combine it with the pasta so it doesn't stick together. You may dis be dismayed that the broccoli is not bright green. It may make you think of overcooked cafeteria broccoli with its strong odor and taste. Slightly overcooked broccoli is very unpleasant, but there's something magical that happens when you cook broccoli with garlic for a longer time. It becomes very delicious. Serve with Parmesan cheese for a surprising entree. Another brassica family vegetable that is great is cabbage. One of the things I really like about cabbage is the fact that it stores incredibly well. It's a vegetable you can always have on hand and nearly never have to discard. It loses some of its sweetness when stored, but its nutrients last for weeks. I've also discovered that red cabbage is more nutritious than green. As a result, I've been experimenting with using red cabbage more often. One dish I make a lot is cabbage and scallion fried rice. It's a great way to serve rice with reduced calories and increased nutrition. I've taken to making it with red cabbage sometimes, as shown here. You can use a purchased coleslaw mix for this recipe, but I just shred or chop my own cabbage. I remove the outer leaves and create a flat base, as we did for cauliflower. I then cut the head in half. You can cut the core out as I'm doing here, or you can cut the head into quarters and then cut the core out. I usually shred the cabbage using a chef's knife. It works best for me to cut a slice, then turn the slice on its side, and then cut it into shreds. That way, I'm not trying to cut down the entire height of a half head. When I slice, the tip of my knife stays stationary. Often I add other vegetables to the mix. Here I'm food processing some carrots and shredding zucchini. Since I want approximately four cups, I use the only large measuring cup I have, which is one usually used for liquids. I can get away with using it because we're not looking for an exact measurement where I have to precisely level off the top. I like using this four cup measure because it lets me shred cabbage and other vegetables like carrots and easily combine them to come up with a measurement of four cups. 
Next, chop scallions using both the white and green parts. I slice them off first and then chop further. If you don't have scallions, you can use chopped onions. If I'm using onion, I usually chop it finely in a food processor for this recipe. If you have not previously cooked your rice, you can do that now. I like to use brown rice for added nutrition. But whenever you're frying rice, it's always best if you've made the rice earlier, preferably the day before so it's cold. But this recipe can be made with rice newly cooked. Combine the soy sauce, sherry, sesame oil, and brown sugar for the sauce. If you don't have sherry or don't want to use it, you can use broth or even a fruit juice like apple juice. Stir fry the cabbage and other shredded vegetables. Then stir in the rice and scallions or other onions and further stir fry. Add the sauce and stir. The resulting rice is very good with stir fry or as a side with other meals. The great thing is that when you eat a cup of this rice, more than half of the cup is actually vegetables. I wondered if you could make the whole thing in a food processor. Knowing that that would be faster, it actually worked very well. Here is the dish made with food processed vegetables and green cabbage. We really like this as a lunch all on its own. The cabbage becomes very sweet and the textures are really nice. Our next brassica vegetable is Brussels sprouts, one of my favorites. If you can purchase fresh Brussels sprouts, they do pack more nutrients, but you need to use them quickly for the most benefit. We'll look at some recipes using fresh and also one using frozen sprouts. You may already know that roasted Brussels sprouts are delicious. Our first recipe is a sesame seed variation. For this recipe, you trim off the outer leaves and then quarter the sprouts. Now I thought those pieces would be way too small for roasting. I usually just have them, but they really do work well in this recipe when they're quartered. Be sure to quarter them the long way so that some of the core is on each of the segment to hold it together. When you trim Brussels sprouts, you often have to trim off a lot. I trim until I get to the paler leaves that have not been touched by the sun. Next, combine these ingredients. The sesame flavor is added through the seeds in this mixture and through some sesame oil added after roasting. Sesame oil doesn't do well at high temperatures, so be sure you wait to add it. Toss the sprouts with the olive oil mixture and roast them at 500 degrees. Yes, that's a very high temperature, but it works well with the fairly small sized pieces. The somewhat charred leaves are delicious. Add the sesame oil, adjust the salt and pepper if needed, and serve. You'll be surprised how good this dish is. One of our favorite Brussels sprout sides is sauteed shredded Brussels sprouts. For this recipe, we have trimmed Brussels sprouts and then sliced them perpendicular to the bottom. You'll be surprised how different the vegetable is cut this way. Don't try to take the core out. The contrast between the thin leaves and the small pieces of more firm core really add to this dish. I use a combination of butter and olive oil for this recipe. You could use just olive oil or just butter for that matter. I like to use some butter for flavor and some olive oil to limit saturated fats. Saute the shredded Brussels sprouts over medium to medium high heat, adding salt and pepper until crisp tender. The pepper really contributes to the flavor, so I encourage you to use it. Turn off the heat and add the balsamic vinegar and toss. Balsamic vinegar is very greatly. For a dish like this, you want an aged one that is syrupy. I only use balsamic vinegar for recipes like this, so a bottle will last for a long time. It really isn't needed for every salad dressing. I use white or red wine vinegar for the dressings. This is really a great side. It doesn't feel like you're eating Brussels sprouts. 
It's amazing how the way a vegetable is cut can change the way we feel about it and even the way we taste it. I said we would look at one recipe that used frozen Brussels sprouts, and this one includes frozen peas as well, a vegetable of my childhood that I've been recently rediscovering. First, steam the frozen Brussels sprouts. I cut them in half if they're very large. As soon as they're tender, I shock them in a bowl of ice water so they don't overcook. Then I drain them. Since taking this photograph, I've actually started cutting almost all Brussels sprouts in half. They're just so much easier to eat that way. To make the sauce, puree thawed green peas with cream. When I made this sauce the first time, this was the closest thing I could come to for a smooth sauce. I realized that my small food processor needed a new blade. Keep in mind that blades on processors sometimes need replacing. This is what the sauce looks like with the new blade. Next, saute the Brussels sprouts in butter with salt and pepper. The result is a surprisingly good side that uses only frozen vegetables. The combination of the sweetness of the green peas and the slight bitterness of Brussels sprouts is a great one. Our next brassicas vegetable is kale, a nutritional powerhouse. It's great to eat kale on its own, but you may find it easier to use small amounts with other vegetables. Since raw kale is especially nutritious, I shred it up and add it to any salad I'm making. Here it's been added to a Mediterranean salad. Here I've added both kale and cabbage to a standard tossed salad. It's an easy, painless way to eat kale and feed it to your family without their necessarily even noticing it. I also add it to a lot of soups and stews. This is a very good recipe that includes kale. It's Caribbean red beans and kale. As always, it's best to prepare all your ingredients in advance. I've diced onion and then combined garlic and herbs and spices in a dish as they'll be added all at the same time. Probably the most unusual ingredient in this dish is the allspice, which Americans tend to think of as only an ingredient for baked desserts. It's very good in savory dishes like this, and I encourage you to not skip it when you try this recipe. Carefully wash your kale and then strip the leaves from the stalks or spines. If the kale is fresh, you can usually just run your fingers down the stalk to remove the leaves. You can also use a knife to cut alongside the spine. Then chop the kale. I usually save, save the stems for another dish. Saute the onions a few minutes and then add the dish of garlic, herbs, and spices. Cook over a low heat until the onions are very soft. Then add the diced tomatoes and kidney beans. I always use low sodium or reduced sodium canned ingredients whenever they're available. Simmer and then add the kale and cook until it's tender. This is very good served with rice on the side or you can mix rice with it. It also reheats very well. I don't know about you, but I love having leftovers. Next, we're gonna cook with turnips and rutabagas. These two brassicas may both be called turnips by some people, but they're actually two different vegetables. Turnips are usually white or white and purple and are harvested when they're fairly small because they get very woody when they're large. Rutabagas tend to be yellow or yellow and brown and are usually much larger. In grocery stores, they're usually waxed. As you can see in the right-hand photo, the turnip flesh is also white and the rutabagas is much yellower. Generally, rutabagas tend to be sweeter than turnips. I find it best to roast turnips and steam rutabagas. For added sweetness, you can steam rutabagas with apple slices and then mash all. It may be a hard sell for some, but there are some advantages to substituting a turnip and potato puree for mashed potatoes in a meal. The combination is certainly more nutritious holds much better, and reheats better. I've given you a recipe. It involves cubing the two vegetables and then simmering them or steaming them until very tender. 
Then you puree them with butter and adjust seasonings. The pureed mixture is much lighter than mashed potatoes, stays light as it cools, and easily reheats. It's definitely worth a try. It's best made with small, very fresh turnips. We're next going to cook with eggplant, one of my favorite vegetables. It is low in calories and high in fiber and nutrition. We're going to make Thai spicy eggplant with sweet basil, an easy dish that can be a meal when served with rice. It's a great recipe if you're trying to eat a more plant-based diet. Any shape eggplant works fine for this recipe. I cut the ends off the eggplant, stand it up on a cutting board, and cut it in half. Then cut slices, gang them, and dice. You'll have some odd bits, but that's fine. Be sure to leave the skin on. Clean and dice a red bell pepper. Chop onion, mince the garlic, and combine all in a bowl as they will be added at the same time. Prepare the sauce of soy sauce and rice vinegar. Measure out the brown sugar and clean and tear or shred the basil leaves. Because you are stir frying, it's critical that all ingredients are measured in advance so they can be quickly added. Fry the red pepper flakes in oil to flavor the oil. Add the eggplant and stir fry. At right is the tool that works best for me when I'm stir frying in my deep, flat-bottomed frying pan. I also make this sometimes in my wok. Stir fry until most of the eggplant is translucent. Add the red bell pepper, onion, and garlic mixture and continue to stir fry. Add the sauce and sprinkle on the sugar and stir. Add the fresh basil and you have a beautiful and delicious entree or side. We often serve it with rice as a meal. Here I'm serving it with red cabbage and scallion fried rice, the recipe we made earlier. It would look better visually with green cabbage rice, but red is what I had on hand. Our next eggplant recipe is definitely an entree, and one even non-vegetarians will find satisfying, eggplant gratin. Grattans are always topped with a browned crust of some sort. In this case, the crust is a ricotta cheese and egg custard that's delicious. A long eggplant works best for this recipe. I slice the eggplant half into one half inch thick slices across. If the eggplant has a very wide bottom, I then slice those in the wider section in half again, as on the right. Lay these slices on a baking sheet that's been brushed with oil, and then lightly brush the tops with oil. Eggplants will readily soak up any oil you apply, so use it sparingly. You may have seen recipes where the eggplant is salted first and let to drain in a colander. People traditionally use salt to remove the bitterness. Actually, all that does is distract from it. And modern eggplants have had most of the bitterness bred out of them, so that really isn't necessary. Sometimes eggplant is salted to remove excess water, but that's not necessary for this dish. Bake, flip over, and continue until both sides are browned. The sauce can be made with fresh tomatoes, but it's fine made with canned tomatoes. I like to use canned whole tomatoes, which I crush with my hands as shown at left. Garlic and chopped onions are sautéed along with herbs de Provence. This is a wonderful combination of herbs that's well worth purchasing. It's key to this dish, and I think you'll find it use it for other dishes. Crush the herbs before adding them for stronger flavor. The sauce will become fairly thick. You can bake this in one or two layers. I like to make just one layer in a larger baking dish. It can be rectangular or round, but does need to have two inch sides. I often use a nine by 13 lasagna pan. When making the dish with one layer, spread half of the sauce in the bottom. Add the baked eggplant overlapping pieces in rows that touch. 
lightly season with salt and pepper, and scatter torn basil leaves over the top. Spread the rest of the sauce over the eggplant, and then prepare the topping. The topping includes saffron, which gives the custard a wonderful yellow color. If you don't have saffron, it's probably best to just leave it out. You'll lose a little earthy flavor, but the gratin will still be delicious. If you are using saffron, you'll need to crumble it and soak it in one tablespoon of hot water. Prepare the custard, adding both the saffron and its soaking water. Spread the custard over the eggplant, bake, and serve. It makes a wonderful entree. In the handout at the end, I've included directions for also making the gratin in a smaller dish that requires two layers of eggplant. I find one layer makes a very nice serving. Next, we'll work with sweet potatoes, which are much more nutritious than russet potatoes. As with many vegetables, boiling them reduces their nutritional benefits, while steaming, roasting, and baking increase them. This salad may well become a favorite for fall. It's really different and good. Roasted sweet potatoes with black beans. I first cut the red pepper. It's easiest to just slice down the pepper four times. It's easier and safer than trying to cut around the stem and core. Then finally dice the red pepper because this is not going to be cooked. Next, I prepare the sweet potato for roasting. Here I'm weighing my sweet potatoes to have the right proportions for the salad. Again, I've used tear weight in order to accurately weigh, weigh the potatoes on a plate. We need to peel the potatoes and cut into one inch pieces. Sometimes wedges are the easiest way to get consistently sized pieces when you're working with a shape like a sweet potato. Next, dice a red onion and toss it with the sweet potato, salt and pepper, and olive oil on a baking sheet, and roast at 400 degrees. When these are roasted, I immediately add them to the bowl with the diced red peppers. The heat will soften the peppers a bit. Gently mix. Put the dressing ingredients in a small food processor. Be sure to protect yourself when handling hot peppers. I usually use food service gloves. If you don't have gloves and are just doing a quick job, you can do what I'm doing here and hold the pepper with a twice folded paper towel. Add olive oil to the ingredients and process to make the dressing. Chop fresh cilantro. Fresh is really important as dried cilantro really has a very different flavor. If the stems are tender, I don't worry about including the top parts of them that are between the leaves. Rinse a can of black beans under running water and drain. Again, I always use reduced sodium beans if they're available. Combine all the ingredients and you end up with this delicious salad which holds very well in the refrigerator and is great served at room temperature or warm. Our next recipe using the sweet potato is a dessert recipe, sweet potato babinka. For this recipe, we roast the potatoes whole, which is a great way to cook them even if you're just eating them as a side. Once they have roasted, the skin pulls right away. We roast them until they're very soft for this recipe. Next, we puree the sweet potato in a food processor and then strain it. I'm using a food mill here to do the straining. You can also use a sieve, forcing the potatoes through. This results in a very smooth ingredient. We line and spray a two inch high pan. The only round pan I have that's that high is a spring form pan, which works just fine. You can line it with a disc cut from parchment paper or wax paper. I just trace around the pan and then cut the disc out. Next, combine the strained sweet potato with nutmeg, eggs, sugar, and turmeric. Nutmeg is the one spice that I always freshly grate. It is a primary flavor in this dessert, so it's really great to have freshly grated nutmeg. 
The nutmegs store very easily and a microplane works great for grating. You could use ground nutmeg if you don't have any whole nutmegs. Add the coconut milk and flour and mix. Coconut milk is not that thin watery liquid that spills out when you break open a coconut. It's made using grated coconut. You can find canned coconut milk in the Asian food section of your supermarket. Be sure to shake it before opening as the coconut cream will collect at the top. Bake for 55 minutes. Then turn the oven off and leave the babinka in the oven with the door propped open with a wooden spoon or something else. This allows the babinka to cool more slowly as you would a cheesecake. It's still likely to have a crack or two on top, but it will crack less. Be sure to make this the day before you want to serve it so you can refrigerate it overnight and then remove it from the pan. It's delicious. Several who have taken this class have told me that babinka has replaced pumpkin pie at their Thanksgiving dinners. Next we'll be cooking with winter squash. There are always wonderful varieties at farmers markets and even grocery stores stock many for a period in the fall. These are some of the more common squash. We'll work with butternut, delicata, sweet dumpling, spaghetti, and pumpkin. Notice that squash vary in terms of the relationship between the volume of the squash and the amount of actual flesh. One of the reasons I like butternut squash is that a large proportion of the volume is actual flesh that you can use. The butternut squash is also a great source of nutrition and fiber. This first recipe combines butternut squash with sweet potatoes. To work with squash, I cut the ends off to stabilize it and then slice it in half. Next, we prepare both vegetables for roasting. I scoop out the squash seeds and fibers with a tablespoon. It's important to poke some holes in the sweet potato so it doesn't explode in your oven. You don't have to do that with the squash because you've cut it in half. Brush oil on the vegetable surfaces and the baking sheet. I often cover it with aluminum foil as the sugars in these vegetables tend to caramelize and can be quite messy on the pan. The squash is placed cut side down. Roast until both are very tender. They'll both get quite sweet. Mash the vegetables or put them through a food mill. You can use a food processor, but it'll make the vegetables watery. They'll actually come out the consistency of frozen squash. I really like the dish better when the vegetables are put through a food mill. Transfer the two vegetables to a pan. Prepare the citrus zest. I like to use half orange and half lemon zest. The zest is boiled for three minutes and then strained, which makes it much more subtle. Simmer the mashed vegetables with the zest, oil, cinnamon, salt, and pepper. The result is a great Thanksgiving side with no added sugar. We've also discovered that it goes very well with a spicy stuffed poblano and salsa. The sweetness of this dish is a nice contrast with a spicy entree. Our next butternut squash dish also includes Brussels sprouts. For this dish, we peel and seed the squash. I'm able to easily peel the squash with my vegetable peeler. If you want the peeling to be easier, you can slice off the ends of the squash, poke holes with a fork as you do a potato before baking it, and microwave the squash for about three and a half minutes. Let it cool until easy to handle and peel with your peeler. Roasting time may be slightly less. Cut it into slices and then into cubes. The hollow bottom section may be easier to just cut into segments around the curve. Trim your Brussels sprouts and cut them in half unless they're very small. 
Put them on a baking sheet, then toss them with oil. Be sure to put the cut side down on the Brussels sprouts so there will be nice caramelization. I then salt and pepper them. Roast the vegetables. Turn them when the bottoms become nicely caramelized and add dried cranberries for the last five minutes. The sugars in the squash will nicely brown, as will the cut sides of the Brussels sprouts. Mix the dressing. Coarse ground Dijon mustard is used. Sometimes this is called country mustard. If you substitute regular Dijon, I would use a little less and then add more as needed after tasting it. The dressing also includes rice vinegar, which is less acidic than regular vinegar. If you substitute another vinegar, again start with less and then add as needed. I use a small whisk to combine the dressing. Gently combine the vegetables with the dressing for a beautiful fall side dish. This has been a hit at our Thanksgiving dinner for a number of years. I just recently discovered two winter squashes that don't need to be peeled. I especially love Delicata, the long skinny squash. These are available even in supermarkets for a brief period in the fall. I cut off the end to steady the squash, cut it in half, remove the seeds, and then slice it. I usually slice it very thinly, as at the top right, but you can also slice it more thickly, as below. I just toss in olive oil, add a sprinkling of kosher salt, and roast. I like to roast it until it gets dark and crisp. It is sweet and delicious. You can do the same thing with sweet dumpling squash as well. Spaghetti squash have been popular for many years. I could never get myself to use it in place of real spaghetti with tomato sauce, but I've recently discovered that it's actually a delicious vegetable. This is a recipe I really like, spaghetti squash with garlic and parmesan. First, the squash needs to be cut in half, which can be a little tricky. I remove a slice from the bottom, set it on my cutting board, and then insert my knife to the right of the stem. You don't want to try to cut through the stem. It's way too tough. Work your knife down the side. Do the same with the other side and then just twist or pull to separate the sections. Most of the stem will stay with one of the halves, so it will never need to be cut through. Remove the seeds and pulp. At first I was afraid because I knew that the meat would eventually be pulled off in strands, but at this point the meat is very solid. You don't need to worry about removing it by mistake with the seeds. Brush the cleaned squash with oil. Add the cider, sprinkle with salt and pepper, and bake. You'll then be able to use a fork to tease out the strands. As you do that, a lot of the remaining cider will be absorbed by them. Put the strands into a bowl and add the shells to your compost pile or garbage. Chop parsley and grate parmesan. If I have a lot of parsley on hand, I will sometimes roughly chop it and then process it in a mini processor. I freeze the extra wrapped in aluminum foil and then put in a freezer container or bag. That way you never waste fresh herbs. Saute garlic in oil and butter and then add the squash and saute it. Add parmesan and parsley and you have a wonderful dish. Pumpkins can be used for more than jack-o'-lanterns, but be sure you select the best pumpkins, which are not the large ones, but rather the ones that are often called pie pumpkins, the smaller ones in front here. You can make your own puree for many recipes. Slice the pumpkin in half as we did the spaghetti squash. Pull the pumpkin halves apart and remove the seeds, but don't throw them out. We'll roast them in a bit. Brush the outside and inside of the pumpkin with oil. Roast and then scoop out the flesh and puree it. It will likely be yellower than canned pumpkin. You can see the difference in color here. 
I've also provided a recipe for roasting the pumpkin seeds. Separate the seeds from the pulp. I find it easiest to do that in a bowl of water. Strain them. Simmer the seeds in salted water and then roast them. The hardest thing is to be sure you roast them long enough that they're crisp. You can eat the entire shell or you can shell them and eat just the kernels. Either is fine and both are delicious. You can use some of your pumpkin puree to make pumpkin mac and cheese. On the left is the recipe made on top of the stove with bow tie pasta. On the right is the recipe made with multicolored pasta and baked in the oven. Either is very good and both have fewer calories and less fat than regular mac and cheese. For this recipe, cheese is shredded. I often combine different cheeses. I shred them on a box grater. The rest of the ingredients are assembled to make the sauce, milk, mustard, flour, nutmeg, the pumpkin puree, and salt and pepper. Butter is melted in a saucepan. Flour is added and cooked, and then the other ingredients are added. I use a whisk to keep everything smooth. It's removed from the heat and the cheese is stirred in until it's melted. Next you stir in the pasta and either serve it or bake it. Either way, it's a great side. One of the last vegetables we'll work with is leeks, which are very nutritious and low in calories. Sautéed leeks and carrots is a surprisingly wonderful side that's very easy to make. First, gather the produce. For a recipe like this, I do weigh my vegetables to be sure I have the right proportions, especially the first time I make the recipe. You'll use only the white and light green portions of the leeks. Cleaning leeks can be challenging. As you can see, sand and dirt accumulate between layers. Before washing them, I slice them in half, as at right. I then slice them crosswise into half circles and put them in a bowl of water. I then use my fingers to pull the segments apart. Be sure the water is deep enough that the leeks can float to the top, which will let the sand sink to the bottom. Then I just skim the leek pieces off, leaving the grit behind. Don't pour the leeks into a sieve or colander. The dirt will end up on top of them. Thinly slice the carrots. If they're large, I cut them in half and slice half moons. You should end up with similar volumes of the two vegetables. Steam the carrots and then shock them in a bowl of ice water. Let them drain. Saute the leeks in butter. You may discover core pieces like the one in the middle photograph where you didn't slice quite enough of the root off. Remove those as they'll not cook down well. Add the carrots and salt and pepper and you have a wonderful, very colorful side dish. The sauteing brings out the sweetness of both the carrots and the leeks. Our last vegetable is one that we newly grew last year. It's an amazing plant and vegetable. It produced all summer. We kept cutting off okra and it kept growing taller with its beautiful blooms. It thrived even when we were gone for three weeks in August and there was no rain. We're going to fix a simple okra and tomato dish today. Okra has to be cut almost daily but you seldom get enough to make a dish. If I don't want to use the okra for a few days or a few weeks, I pop the day's pick into the freezer. That way I can pull it out later and combine it with freshly picked okra. Many don't like okra because they feel it's slimy. There are two ways that you can avoid that. By cutting off the stems properly and adding vinegar or some other acid to the dish. If okra are very young, I don't trim off the stem at all. It cooks down just fine. If you do feel like you need to trim it off, be sure you don't trim too far down so you expose the seeds and mucilage. That's what ends up making the, what people call slime. 
For this dish, we combine okra, cherry or grape tomatoes, and scallions. These are mixed in a baking pan with Parmesan, rice vinegar, and salt. If you're vegan, you can substitute nutritional yeast for the Parmesan, as I've done in this photo. This mixture is baked at 450 degrees. The tomatoes bake down and make a great sauce. Garnished with more green onions, it's a beautiful and very tasty dish. Following are full recipes for all of the dishes we've looked at. Remember that you can pause the video at any point to spend longer with a particular recipe or to photograph it. On page one are the recipes for roasted Brussels sprouts and squash with dried cranberries and Dijon vinaigrette and for sautéed shredded Brussels sprouts. On page two are the recipes for Mediterranean cauliflower rice and for quick jolly green Brussels sprouts. Page three includes recipes for cabbage and scallion fried rice, sautéed leeks and carrots, and zippy roasted cauliflower. Page four provides recipes for Caribbean red beans and kale, pureed turnips, and broccoli cauliflower salad. Page five features the recipe for Southern Italian pasta with broccoli and for Thai spicy eggplant with sweet basil. And at the bottom are tips for working with butternut squash, including how to microwave the squash for easier peeling. Page six includes recipes for roasted sweet potato salad with black beans and roasted squash and sweet potato with citrus. Page seven includes the recipes for sweet potato bibinka and okra and tomatoes. Recipes on page eight include eggplant gratin and homemade pumpkin puree. Page nine features recipes for roasted pumpkin seeds, easy pumpkin mac and cheese, and sesame roasted Brussels sprouts. Page 10 provides the recipes for spaghetti squash with garlic and Parmesan, and the recipe for cauliflower and cheese pie. Thank you for your interest in this presentation. We hope you'll enjoy using some of these recipes to cook with fall vegetables.